Have you time now? Joining me for this discussion is Honorable Musalia Mudavadi, ANC party leader and of course former finance minister, together with Honorable Bilokero, who is the former Mandera senator and of course former Senate Finance Committee chairperson. Before I ask uh, both you gentlemen my first question, I want you to listen to the challenges that Kenyans are facing at a time like this. <laughs> Hata saa hii umeona kazi hizi ya magari ya kwanza imeingia kazi imetu affect sana hakuna kazi na tangu hii mambo ya corona ianze wafanyikia biashara wa hapa machakos wale wadogo wadogo hakuna biashara kamwe ukifungua nduka kama ni asubuhi unapata watu wawili watatu kwenda ikufika jioni saa kumi na moja kwa sababu ya kafio unapata kama mia mbili ama mia tatu Iyo miambili, miatadu diyo nanunia watoto chakula, diyo naenda kulipa stima, diyo naenda kulipa kila kitu. Ii mambo ya corona wakati iliingia katika taifaletu, kila kitu imiarifika kafisa. Kwa maana hata ukiangalia, hata town, kulikuwa kuna kuja watu wengi sana. Lakini kwa kuisikuisi, hakuna watu. Na wale unaona, ni wale wanaaso tu ile shiringi kumi, shiringi shirini. Na iyo hakuna kitu ita, inasaiti ya mtu na. Sickness started to roam, uh, roll around the country. It has affected everything. All the businesses have uh, turned down because we were expecting bigger volumes of income which have gone to like slightly a quarter. Na kutoka wakati wa corona ilipo ingia, wakati events ilisimamishwa, sasa watu wawana rusa ya kukutana mahali pa moja. Hivyo basi ni kumanisha kwamba, Mambo kama ya tens, mambo ya kufanya events, mambo ya video coverage na mambo ya kupangisha mambo kama events, haya endelei siku kama hizi. Siku, hapo mwanzoni nilikuwa nafanya kazi ingine, nilikuwa nafanya kazi ya ofisi kama kupangisha watu kwenda Nairobi. Na ni kwa vile Nairobi kwa lockdown, hatuna kazi ingine ya kufanya na imeni piti nitafute mbinu ingine, pili nitafute chakula siku. Hapa kapsa bed, kazi sote, sa kujenga sote simesimama. Juu inasemekana kwamba mahali penye munafanya kazi inataka distance na maybe penye unafanya hiyo kazi inataka mtu akue karibu na wewe. Real concerns by real Kenyans. That's, those are some of the messages we're getting out there. And of course, let me start with you, Honorable Musalia Mudavadi. As a party leader, as a political leader, I'm sure you are getting that feedback uh, from people out there. Yes. My question to you is this, and I hope you can hear me. If you are seated yes. in Treasury today, a position that you are familiar with, what would be going on in your mind tonight and what would be your answers to some of the many questions that Kenyans are asking? Well, first of all, let me pass my regards to Bill O'Carroll. He's a very resourceful individual, a good friend of mine, and I'm happy to engage in this conversation thank you, with him. Thank you. Well. Greetings to you, sir. Um, thank you so much, Bill um, I think, uh, first of all, I must say I'm thank lucky you, I'm not sitting at the Treasury at this moment because uh, the person sitting at the Treasury has an immense uh, task uh, on his hands. Um, this is a time when uh, one would be looking at a lot of fundamental things. One, the economy was already declining. That's a, that's a given. Uh, we, they had already started uh, downgrading uh, the growth projections initially at six. Uh, then they said it would come to maybe 5% of GDP. Mm -hmm. And lately we have seen that it may go uh, further south, uh, maybe to about 1% or 1.2%, if not worse. So clearly there is a big problem uh, with, the, with the economy at this point in time. Now, this is compounded by the uh, global pandemic, the COVID, which has accelerated the challenges we are facing. And uh, remember, we were already reeling from heavy debt uh, as a country. Uh, our G GDP is about 10 trillion uh, Kenya shillings. Mm -hmm. And debt level, public debt levels are now sitting close to 6.2 trillion. So clearly, this and so many other challenges uh, are mega for the person sitting in the Treasury. Would you, would you actually describe it, it as an overwhelming situation? It is. It is. This is a situation that cannot be taken lightly. Um, and uh, frankly speaking, it should be a matter of concern to every patriotic Kenyan mm -hmm. that uh, we are in this kind of situation and we really need to pull together. Um, this is not a, t a time where we'd, we should be engaging in what you might call scoring points. 
okay. uh, against each other. This is a real national crisis. And, and we and are going, going to get deeper into it, Honorable Musalia, shortly. Uh, but let me bring in Honorable Bilokero, who is an experienced parliamentarian. You're a former chair of a finance committee. And as you listen to Kenyans tonight, and as you think of parliament, yes. as an institution in your view, can you say it has risen up to the challenge that Kenyans are facing tonight? Or do you feel that they are just approving what uh, the executive pans their way or passes their way? Thank you very much and greetings to my friend. Um, mm. He's a diplomat, very measured in his words. <laughs> but um, I, I think it would be an understatement to say our parliament has um, not risen to occasion. I think um, Parliament is not just overwhelmed. Parliament, uh, uh, because of what has happened globally, um, and, and the situation has never happened in the world before, um, I, I'm sure Parliament is just paralyzed. They don't, they don't know what to do uh, under the circumstances. So, um, and, and of course, the last few years, Parliament has ceased to be independent. Parliament has become an appendage of the executive, if you will. Uh, and has more or less become a rubber stamp of the executive. So unless the executive pushes something their way in terms of legislation, in terms of you know, this proposal or that, uh, parliament has not really on its own initiative um, come up with anything so far that we can say, yes, this is parliament driven and it has helped the people of Kenya in the current um, circumstances. So on a scale of one to 10, you would give them a... Well, I'll give them maybe three. Three. Yep. Okay. Let our viewers yep. think. Let our viewers, Honorable Kero, think about that as we take that break. We're going to get deep into the issues: job creation, job losses, state of the economy, debt, and graft. When we resume, of course, my two guests on standby to have that discussion. That and so much more on the other side of this break. You're watching Newsnight. Stay with us. The discussion continues shortly. Welcome back to Newsnight. Honorable Musele Mudavadi, Honorable Bilokero, still on standby for that discussion. But before that, we have some of your feedback. These are some of your thoughts regarding our topic tonight. Remember, our SMS line is 22422, and the hashtag is Newsnight. Here's the first one. This one from Mwaura Edward. You say Kenya's economy was actually dead even before COVID-19. I would say COVID-19 was God sent. It came in at the right time for this government. Now blame everything on it. Okay. That's one view there from Edward. And Kenny Jamison also says, we should blame the government for poor economical decision making. At the end of this pandemic, most Kenyans shall be poorer than ever. Most jobs shall be closed down. It's time we sit and discuss progress as a nation thanks to COVID-19. Okay, we'll take a look at a few others a bit later on in the program. Honorable uh, Bilokero, before we took the break, you gave Parliament three out of ten. If you were the finance uh, Senate chair at this time, what would you do differently? What laws would you be pushing to pass? Well, I think th th there are a number of things we need to look at. For example, I think that we need to put this matter in perspective so Kenyans to understand. This pandemic um, is, has brought on board one of the worst recessions the world will ever have seen. In fact, according to IMF, it's unprecedented. Um, and so what is likely to happen, uh, according to their prediction, is that most countries, particularly the developed countries, will have double-digit uh, decline in economic growth. Um, and with most countries already highly indebted, uh, countries will not be able to raise sufficient fiscal stimulus, the one that we saw in 2008 from the developed countries. And so what is likely to happen is not what we are seeing. You know, this, what we are looking at is, you know, the, 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 the small challenges we are facing today. But I think the world is interconnected. Um, we already we have challenges. We are not able to achieve our exports. The tea is not going out. Horticulture is not going out. The tourism has been affected significantly. The inflows, you know, from remittance, everything. And then locally, all the sectors from retail to manufacturing to transport, every sector has been, has been badly affected. So what has happened is that the problem that is happening in the rest of the world is going to have a dominant effect in most of our economies, particularly this one, uh, like ours. So me, I would think that um, I agree with what somebody said earlier, Mwaru said earlier, that the economy was already on free fall. So what we need to do is to look at how we can retain jobs. I think that is, for me, the most fundamental thing, if I was today in Senate, would be looking at. And so we look at many measures 
that many countries have taken. If you look at across the board, all the way from Germany to Korea to Australia, many measures. So if you go through them, you can select some of those measures that have been applied in some of these countries, which are really important in terms of retaining jobs. We may not afford some of them. For example, bailing out companies, what other countries are doing, trying to give grants, loans, you know, um, you know, to companies to try and bail them out, mm -hmm. and paying salaries of people who are in companies so that they are not thrown out of jobs. We may not be able to do. So what I was thinking of is that if I was there, some of the, some of the things I suggest we would do would include, for example, expand what the president talked about the other day about the youth temporary okay. get a million youth after this pandemic is over get a million youth out there even if it's for ten thousand a month for three months it's 30 billion but at least you'll get money out there and stimulate demand because okay. right now the challenge is is really demand number two and, and you I would, you would, I, I you want would, to interrupt you. I think you very important. We will get because I, I had specifics, and we, one was job creation, one was uh, Kazi Kwa Vijana, or a new initiative called Kazi uh, Vijana or Kazi Mtani. Correct. I'm coming to I, have, I have a lot on this. Uh, no, I can see you came re ready here. for this, okay. and I'll give you a chance. But I want to bounce the jobs discussion of <laughs> Honorable Mudavadi with this question. Tonight, Honorable Mudavadi, hotel employees are effectively jobless. It's no secret that the hospitality industry, tourism right. and aviation, if not on their knees, are on their back as well. Many of them are watching this show tonight. As a leader in this country, what kind of future would you promise them? Well, first of all, let us uh, not gloss over anything here. The situation is grim. This is absolutely mm -hmm. important. Very important. And we should not run away from, from that fact. Um, and a lot of the points that uh, Milo has highlighted are true. Now, the biggest crisis uh, is that the government of Kenya and many other developing countries are facing the same crisis. We do not have the kind of resources uh, that uh, the bigger economies have to bail out uh, big, uh, the, the aviation industry, to bail out the entire tourism industry and so forth. We do not have those kind of resources. So clearly, uh, we will need to be more innovative uh, and at the same time living within our means uh, under the circumstances. Because at the same time, we must be very clear, there are no good Samaritans that are going to come on board immediately at this point in time. So one of the things that I believe uh, we ought to do is first of all, to pick up from where the president said, uh, and I want to, to commend him for this. Uh, president Uhuru Kenyatta did say that uh, very soon, he intends to uh, put together um, uh, a non-partisan uh, team of Kenyans mm -hmm. uh, from all sectors to think through uh, how to get uh, out of the economic morass that we are in now. That is a very important thing, and I would like to urge him uh, to follow through on that particular issue so that we can have uh, a broad participation of Kenyans who can offer ideas. And this should not be a political uh, uh, driven uh, or a political entity. It should be people coming out there to give very genuine uh, uh, pieces of advice on the way forward. Now, in the area of tourism, let us be realistic. International travel is going to uh, be suspended for quite some time. The recovery level in terms of expecting tourists from outside may not be there. So chances are uh, the first call of, uh, when we start recovering is going to be the local tourist. So right now, the Kenyan people, uh, the Kenyan government should uh, accelerate that conversation, okay. bring employees together, bring workers together, bring business people together. Then we can start crafting uh, the way forward in order to be able provide solutions for some of these sectors. Speaking of the way forward, uh, so hotel employees tonight, one, they don't know if they have jobs or not for many of them, but secondly, they might only have enough money in their accounts or food in their stores for a certain amount of time. As you project, would you be able to tell them when you next think they'll be able to comfortably provide meals for their families? I think it's very difficult. Uh, it's, it's going to be a long haul, a painful long haul. Um, uh, and we will all have to tighten our belts because, uh, Mora, right now, we have no vaccine, neither do we have a cure for the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So we may, uh, in a few days' time, start thinking on how to live with this virus.
because we don't know whether the, the cure will come at the end of the year or whether it will come next year mm -hmm. or even later than that. So we, are, uh, we have to understand that it's a completely abnormal situation. And therefore, uh, not just for the hotel workers, not the hospitality industry only, for all people, uh, we are going to have to have a look, look at a raft of measures. For instance, if the workers, the hoteliers and, and uh, who are employers, and they were sitting with the employees, what kind of things can we do? One, they have taken maybe wage cuts already. Yeah. Two, some are already at home, and they may have to be laid off. Uh, yeah. But going forward, a holistic approach where the government working with the private sector may start looking at what kind of incentives can be developed into our policy okay. that will be able to allow the hoteliers to come back on board and consequently the employers to come on board within the shortest time possible. Okay. Uh, Honorable Bilokero, is it fair to blame the current state of yeah. affairs all on the coronavirus? No, of course not. Um, our economy was already on a free fall, I said earlier. Um, we already had a crisis, um, you know, companies shutting down, um, employee layoffs, you know, suppliers, contractors not being paid, and, um, and Kenyans not having money in their pocket. In, you know, in, in paper, the economy was growing, but in reality, the economy was in a free fall. I, I, think, I think, for me, I look at it from a, a global perspective, that in 2008, we were lucky. It was just the Wall Street, and, and, and the impact was global. Today, the impact is not about Wall Street, it's about the whole world being affected. So what, what I would suggest, a similar situation is what happened in 1945 after the Second World War, when Europe collapsed because of the of war. And what did they do, the Americans and the Europeans, and they set up the Marshall Plan uh, for the economic recovery of Europe, you remember. And this is when the Bretton Woods Institute, institutions like IMF and World Bank was set up to try and um, uh, deal with the economic crisis uh, that, that came. I, I think uh, what happened last month when um, G20 countries and um, these countries met to uh, you know, announce a waiver, uh, a moratorium on, on debt for poor countries, uh, 40 of them in Africa, is not enough. I, I think nothing short of a complete right of, of debts, and that will not happen immediately because many of the countries which would have generated uh, or stimulated the economy in the world, those Western countries, they're already highly indebted and they are facing the same crisis. So in my view, really, at our level, even today, as what the president needs to do, let me tell you, is he must call a summit of all the governors and himself and have a coordinated national approach really in terms of policy. Because we have a situation today, you open the paper, a governor is announcing building of houses, another government office is, you know, is building, a ministry is building some offices somewhere. They're oblivious to the challenges that really the world is facing. They, 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 they really underestimate the enormity of the problem that we have. And, and so in, in my view, really, it's, 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 it's time the government simply um, looked at how do we incentivize companies and businesses to remain so that they can keep employees in and, and that requires a lot of things yes if you were to waive all the taxes if you were to delay or defer loans get the banks to zero rate to to to, to reduce the interest rates to to zero america and other countries they reduce this interest rate to zero and so that the banks, you know, you know, so, so that companies but, can, but, can, but, can survive, but, businesses but, can survive. Honor, I think there are fundamental Honorable actions, Kero, in sorry, my view, I, I, I need and, and, and recourse, yes. I'm interrupting you because you are the one who began by saying the economy was already in a free fall. You are giving solutions that are, that are being carried out Correct. in Western nations. Can our economy really afford all the nice things you are pro I know many viewers are saying tonight, yes, that's what we want. But you know what the underlying numbers are. No, you see, we always underestimate our ability. We have a three trillion shilling uh, budget okay. from a 10 trillion shilling economy. It's not small. It's more than the whole of East Africa combined. If we sit down and really prioritize, the reason why we have had crisis in this country is two. One, conspicuous consumption. We waste all our money. Second is because of the um, misplaced priorities. I think it's time the government sat down and looked at the problem. How do we get back on our feet? Okay. Do we need to start putting money on, on, on big projects, mega projects? Do we need to stimulate the economy across the country so that everyone is able to get back on its feet? And there are Let many things that can be 
done fully in this regard. So Let me that, allow... that's my thinking. I think it, we, need, Let... we need to look at it from that point of view. You've raised some interesting points that I want Honorable Musalia to respond to. One, wastage, two mega projects that uh, some say don't make sense on the ground. Honorable Musalia, let me give you a chance to respond to that. Your thoughts? Yes, Mora, I think um, these are very fundamental issues. First of all, the issue of debt, we must be prepared to confront it. Uh, we must be prepared to sit and negotiate with all our creditors where we can have it uh, totally returned, written off well and good, uh, where we can have penalties and interest rates altered, where there's a moratorium. Let's work for it, and there should be that right. should be done immediately. And I hope uh, the Treasury in this country mm. has set up a mm. that is working on a, a long-term strategy to deal with the debt. Now, that is one aspect. The other thing that I need to talk about is that we need to rationalize our expenditure uh, programs and at right. the same time That's figure out how we, can, mm. how we can raise revenues. Now, when I say rationalize expenditure, let me give you a classic example. Right now, uh, Mr. Mora, uh, and this is in the government documents, there are about 1,000 projects that would cost the uh, Kenyan taxpayer, one trillion Kenya shillings that were out there, signed off, and believe you me, about 500 of them have stalled completely. They're not moving. What does that tell you? That tells you that sure. those projects are not well thought out. They were engineered for a specific purpose, mainly maybe for graft, to take money out of the system. And somewhere along the line, the government realizes that there's no more money to deal with that. So this is an area that we must actively deal with. And how do we deal with it? We have to deal with it by taking certain things seriously. For instance, why do we take almost a year to replace the uh, Auditor General? Why are we taking so long to do that? These are the institutions that matter, that help bring accountability. Now, we are talking, for instance, of the Ministry of Health. And by the way, there have been mega scandals in the Ministry of Health. Um, but when you have an emergency program like what we have today, fighting with the COVID, fighting with floods in Tana River, in Budalangi, in Garissa, in Nyando and everywhere, uh, all these things coming together as if the elements have conspired to hit us as a nation. Uh, locusts are also around. Let me tell you, you will find that the emergency programs are going to be the reservoir or the incubators of mega scandals. And all these emergency programs are taking place and we are dilly darling when it comes to appointing the auditor general in our system. These are critical areas, uh, they must be dealt with. So when I talk about rationalizing expenditure and enhancing whatever, we need to do that by making sure that our institutions are working. A few days ago, I made a statement that I said, the war sure. against corruption cannot be put under quarantine. It's the COVID-related uh, cases that go into quarantine. But are we saying that the war on yeah. corruption has gone into quarantine? It has contracted some, some, some virus? These are fundamental issues that mm -hmm. we need to deal with. And uh, yeah. all, all I can say is that yeah. uh, once we do that and we program ourselves as to what would be short-term uh, measures and what would be long-term, if we go long-term, when it comes to the issue of debt, I would strongly advocate for an independent authority guaranteed within a constitutional arrangement to be able to moderate and make sure that we tame the appetite of governments when it comes to borrowing. Okay. And this is not talking about the big government. This is talking about the governments that will come even after. What? So people mm -hmm. do not look at this as a policy position yeah. designed to stifle any particular government at this stage. Okay. It is designed for the posterity of Kenyans. You've that raised, is one measure. Yes, and sorry for interrupting you on this. You've raised the issue yeah. of the Auditor General, the delay in the appointment yeah. of an office holder to that particular position. Why do you think, and you use the word dilly darling, why is there dilly darling from your perspective? I think people don't want to be held to account. This oh, is government? Because for, for, for instance, of course, yeah, the mandarins of, course. Of, 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 of corruption would not want to be held to account. And uh, you, they may not be too far from delaying some of these processes. 
I mean, let's face it. If you are to go to a court of law mm. and there's an issue that involves public finance, I can tell you for free that the lawyers will be insisting that they want to see verified accounts signed off by the Auditor General mm -hmm. before the case can proceed. Now, when this guy is not in office, when this Auditor General is not in office, and that is his constitutional role, you tell me, five years down the line is when you'll be following cases of graft today. We cannot live like that. Okay. Honorable Bilokero, you can respond to that, but and there's a point you made at yeah, the very beginning. Yeah, 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 let me just add. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Let me, let me just add on the issue of the auditor. This country, Kenya, has one of the most advanced financial, uh, you know, um, accountancy professions in Africa, more than even South Africa. If, if you cannot convince anybody in this country that we cannot get an auditor one year after the previous auditor retired, I think that completely is to under, uh, you know, estimate um, um, the intelligence of um, Kenyans. Clearly, I agree with um, Honorable Mudavadi that um, th there's a greater scheme of people who don't want an auditor on board at this particular time or are shopping for a politically uh, correct or a compliant uh, person. So, uh, but but uh, but I I, I think I think um, uh, just to emphasize the point. Um, uh, Honorable Mudabadi made on the on the on the on the date. Um, of course, now much of what we are dealing with is water under the bridge. We have already incurred the debt, and it's, it, the, the question of paying now is impossible. This year, we need this financial year. We need to raise almost 900 billion to service these loans. It's it's not practical, and it's not only us. It's all over the world, and this is why. The G20 countries have already announced about 40 countries will get a one-year moratorium. But I think uh, going forward, in my view, even to stimulate this economy today, the government needs money. So in the short term, there's likelihood that the government, whether locally or not, they have to raise some money so that they can provide some liquidity in the market and, and be able to generate, you know, put money uh, back in the in the pockets of uh, of Kenyans. But having said that, again, the point he mentioned about rationalizing, I think that is the main thing. Isn't is it not surprising that three months after this crisis have started, up to now, our national governments and county governments have not sat down to develop, together with Parliament, to develop a policy or the appropriate policies really to, for intervention in this crisis. Mm -hmm. Up to now. So that you find this joint, there's no coordination. Without an effective, coordinated response mm. by the executive, by legislature, by the counties to this crisis, I think, I think and it clearly shows that we, we do not understand how serious um, this, this matter is. But I think there are many uh, tools. I think, I, 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 let me just complete the points I, I raised earlier, that some are very simple. For example, if you look at the news this week, you find vehicles trucks almost 10, 20 kilometers long at Busia. People who are trying to export goods in this country mm -hmm. have been struggling because the government is looking at the regulatory aspect of examining drivers and so forth. But they fail to appreciate that it is better to facilitate every opportunity to do business today. That is what is fundamental. Every opportunity to facilitate business, even if it means you know, compliance, for example, on tax. By now, government should have announced that if June comes, you do not have to be under pressure to file your returns. Mm -hmm. Give people that voluntary opportunity to comply. Okay. Give businesses opportunities to try and stay alive so that we can stimulate demand. We can, you can get more people back into, into jobs and we can get more money back into the economy. I think this is, we need, we, and it's important that that committee, the president said, needs to come on board probably to start looking at some of these things beyond the, you know, not just looking at the infection, but also to look at the economy at the same time because mm -hmm. it's critical. Uh, you have heard the main reason, the main issues that everybody you interviewed mm -hmm. raised is about their jobs and about getting bread. And mm -hmm. I think that is the point that the government needs to put more and, emphasis and, on. And, and that's where I want to interrupt you. You had, you had raised the issue of jobs and, of course, a Marshall Plan where government quickly finds a way to get a certain percentage of young people to get work at a time like this to ensure that money is moving in the economy. This is where I want to bring in Honorable Musalia. One of the measures that was recently announced by government to engage young people is a scheme called Kazim Tani an initiative to give unemployed youths in urban areas a source of income at a time like this. But to many who heard that announcement, it reminded them of another scheme that was once called Kazi Kwa Vijana. 
and one which began with noble intentions, but at the end of it all was riddled with allegations of poor planning, allegations of corruption as well. When this committee sits down or whatever measures the government will roll out uh, moving forward, how do you ring fence those projects to ensure that the money goes to the intended beneficiaries? You know, this is a, a very interesting thing because there's an element of firefighting and some of the programs that are there are those short term that are likely to spar uh, some element of uh, economic activity at this point in time. That's okay, but those are not sustainable. Uh, they are targeted uh, over a period of time and they may not be sustainable. I think the challenge we have is that we need to work on long-term uh, arrangements. Once we are done with the, the issues of COVID, and the sooner we get out of the COVID pandemic, the better. And this calls for discipline, uh, uh, the, uh, following the guidelines that have been uh, given by the government, so that that particular aspect uh, can be dealt with earlier. But going forward, uh, uh, Moara, when I say rationalize our expenditure, uh, we need to look at some of the projects uh, that the government have, has been getting involved in. Uh, have they stimulated the economy enough? Mm -hmm. For instance, if we take the SGR, the, the, the SGR uh, uh, project, yes, it did provide some stimulus for other contractors and spin-offs uh, within the economy over a particular period of time. Mm. But one fundamental flaw, one fundamental flaw about that project is that virtually all the materials were coming from China. Now, that is... Okay. We seem to have uh, temporarily lost Honorable Mudavadi. I'll bring him back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so okay. the other thing that I just want to point out very quickly, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, just that we seem to have a challenge yeah. with your picture quality, Honorable Mudavadi. Okay. okay. I'll come back to you shortly, Honorable Mudavadi. Let's just sort that. But for Honorable uh, Bilokero, yep. a quick question yep. here. If KRA, yep. and I want to get your thoughts yeah. on this, the Kenya Revenue Authority, do you think yep. their actions are currently in tandem with this particular crisis? Uh, because uh, already we are seeing messages from KRA. They are reminding Kenyans, despite the pandemic, don't forget to file your taxes before June. Is KRA living in utopia? <laughs> the, the <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is an understatement. Utopia is, I mean, all over the world, one of the first institutions that reacted are those institutions that deal with regulatory issues like taxes and revenues and so forth. Because they immediately realize what is happening. The businesses are their cash cows. The businesses are the ones that generate the revenue. So once the businesses are down, what they need to do is to facilitate these businesses. One of the things that they need to do, I think, is, and it's done in many countries now, is to delay any payments of tax is to del to give you know that compliance relax the compliance so that you don't have those deadlines and more importantly i think talk to treasury and um, provide some incentives for companies that can keep employees and this is very important because the, the issue really is about retention of employees as long as employees are on the payroll of companies you will be helping in terms of livelihoods and in terms of you know uh, you know creating demand so they need to think seriously because it's not about just collecting tax and giving to government. I think government needs to appreciate today what is important is not about them spending. It's about Kenyans having money in their pockets so that they can spend, so that they can create demand. If you look at what's going on in the economy, you'll be shocked. For example, petroleum companies. These are some of the largest importers every month. Mm. Today, there's, it has reduced substantially. Where they would get 20 ships, for example, bringing in vessels coming in Mombasa today, you'll find the number of vessels have reduced significantly because what is happening, the lockdown has made it impossible for people to use their vehicles. So consumption of fuel has gone down. The same thing with many other products, really. And, and so today I was talking to someone who imports sugar from Uganda, where they used to get about 20, 30 trucks coming in, imports of sugar from Uganda. The number has gone down to four or five trucks because there's no demand. People have no money to buy things. Uh, so so I, I think we, we should not, government should, should appreciate that 
they may need to raise some revenue, raise a little revenue to pay their workers. But I think beyond that, looking for money for development, looking for money to pay debt, mm -hmm. or looking for money to start doing one of the, those kind of projects, I think they need to forget it, and they need to think about how to leave money in the pockets of Kenyans. And I think that that, that, that fundamental issue is, is Mr. Nkere, therefore, needs to really completely go back uh, to the drawing board and start thinking. And, and that they can only do so if Treasury really, uh, uh, you know, is appreciative of, of, that, okay. of that challenge. Okay, we, we do have Honorable Mudavadi back on. Uh, Honorable yeah. Mudavadi, you are giving me your thoughts on uh, Kazim Tani initiative that the government recently announced, and many see a parallel with uh, Kazi Kwavijana, which began with noble incentive, uh, noble thoughts, but at the end of it all uh, ended without uh, sort of the fanfare that it began with. Your thoughts on how to protect any project that will be used to create jobs at a time like this, Honorable Mudavadi? First of all, I just wanted to say that I was talking about the SGR uh, project as an example, and I did indicate that if we are going to uh, get involved in uh, uh, in mega capital projects, mm -hmm. where virtually all the materials are externally sourced and the local component is very little, then we are not sparing uh, the economy yeah. as we should be doing. So this is a model that we need to reflect on very seriously as a Kenyan people. Uh, the same holds for the county governments uh, that are there, because one of the things that is also ailing the economy is that the government is delaying in paying the contractors County governments are also delaying in paying uh, the contractors and suppliers in their region. And frankly speaking, if you do not pay these people, you are crippling the economy. This is a, this is a fact. The president made some noble pronouncements, yeah. but I can tell you for free that there are still a lot of suppliers and contractors, in spite of the presidential directive, who have not been assisted to get what is due to them. That is wrong. Uh, in each future, because those are people who have the multiplier effect of sparring up uh, the economy. Now, I just want to come back very quickly to, uh, uh, because I did say that the issue of some of the short-term jobs, it's good, they are targeted, for, uh, but that is not sustainable. We need long-term arrangements. Uh, we need to find ways of uh, ensuring that our SMEs can get credit lines uh, that are manageable and affordable. Uh, you know, loans must be affordable because you, have the, you must have the ability to repay that. Now, these are issues that we must continuously uh, uh, look at. Uh, Central Bank has been lowering interest rates. Mm -hmm. uh, SMEs are still struggling to get uh, uh, access. So we need to look at that portfolio further and figure out what is the inhibition that is preventing these SMEs from getting resources. Okay. And these are the kind of that would spur the economy. Okay. Uh, let me just touch something on what uh, Biro said. On one issue, I do not quite agree with him, because the revenue fellow must collect what is due. We must give Caesar what is due uh, to Caesar. After all, a lot of the services that we have uh, uh, are, are dependent on the revenues that we collect. So the catch is this. The government must rationalize its expenditure. I come back to that point. We must. The quickest way to get some resources into our hands is to deal with the issue of debt. The other thing is that the government, when they rationalize their programs and their expenditure, then they'll stop demanding unrealistic targets mm -hmm. from KRA. Because it's the government with its other appetite to do other things that they have not thought out well that is exerting pressure on KRA. And KRA in turn is exerting pressure on the ordinary Kenyan citizen. This is because we are not coordinating our programs. Okay. So on this particular point, as much as we need revenue to be collected, the reality is that when you tell KRA, and this is this financial year that is coming to an end, they're supposed to collect 1.5 trillion Kenya shilling. Do you think they'll be able to get that? They may not be able to meet those targets. And this is why they are literally trying to squeeze water out of stone. I want to allow Honorable uh, Kero to uh, respond to that. Uh, I, I think, I think, yeah, yeah. You, you, you just, just to, just to respond to that a bit. Sorry, I, I think the point that needs to be emphasised is that there are many businesses that are suffering, and I've mentioned this at the beginning. Not just the hotel industry that you mentioned, or the, you know, but there are many sectors of the economy where businesses have literally collapsed or have been shut down, or 
even industries where majority of industries are operating at below half capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I, I think what many countries have done really is not to focus on, because it's very difficult to convince government after you collect the money, try to rationalize or do this or that and, and experience with government, particularly ours, where, and I mentioned this earlier, is very difficult. Mm -hmm. The government that is used to spending, uh, a government that is used to living large, the moment they get that money, it's not going to be easy. So the easiest, the, what most countries, most countries are doing is to try and leave the money at source as much as possible so that companies retain employees. Companies can get the opportunity to start production again and start their businesses and start their lives. I think this is what is important, uh, uh, you know. Um, so maybe a compromise of both. But I think it's very important to appreciate that unless we get the economy on its feet, the issue of just raising, you know, meeting deadlines and targets and you must you deal with KRA and uh, it, it's not going to be easy for many businesses and you will see the level of default that will arise in June when the uh, deadline comes. At least the banks have, 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 have come up with some measures on, on some moratorium on, on, on whatever, but even for the banks, I think we need to go far. Central bank needs to have a meeting with all the banks mm -hmm. and the banks need to reduce significantly, restructure their interests on the loans to something either zero or at least to half of what people are required to pay. And it has happened in many countries because this is not a usual situation. Rather than have all your businesses, all your clients defaulting, I think it's important for you to, 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 to try and you know, salvage the situation. And I think that is something that they need to do. That's For example, on the rental, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they are not, it's not a significant source of income for KRA, but I think if, to try and get landlords to, to, to sympathize with their tenants, there is mm -hmm. need for both the banks and KRA to try and address that issue. Because if the banks can uh, give a longer moratorium to the, to the, to the, to the landlords, um, and, the, and the KRA could also, for example, waive some of the taxes on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the rent or income and so forth, then we could get the you know, landlords trying to you know, reduce the rent yes. or at least give some waiver or provide some time for the... For, I think it's important that these institutions uh, need to look at the, 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 the enormity of the situation. I think, I think it's not just a few hotels and bars which have been closed. I think it's across the board. Many economies have been affected. And, and I want to try and pick up from there. Honorable Musali, I think your concern was if the measures that Honorable Okero is proposing are put in place, then what will government run with, operate with at a time like this? Is that your concern? No, I, I, yes, exactly. We, because at the end of the day, we still have to uh, get taxes coming in. And uh, it is important that KRA uh, does its job. Uh, we, should not, we should not get to a situation where the institutions go into total slumber. But KRA must know that they are taxing people within the Kenyan environment that has been struck by the pandemic and the various job losses that have taken place. That is a fact. Now, the, main, the, the point I was trying to, to, to put across is that uh, performance targets are given to KRA. And those targets are generated because the government, through its budgeting process, has decided it wants to do so many other things and building so many uh, roads, building so many dams, building so many whatever. You, we have had all this, these stories. Uh, the number of stadia they want to put up and what kind of time frame they want to put up those stadia in. Now, all this then puts pressure on KRA to put money on the table very quickly. In addition to that, and in accordance with the Constitution, you know very well that when you have uh, debt, external debt, it has a fast call on the consolidated fund. So whatever money that is being collected, uh, the areas that must be dealt with among the priorities is the issue of settling your debt. Mm -hmm. So the biggest reprieve that can come to the Kenyan people at this point in time is a restructured debt portfolio. They should not uh, prevaricate on this thing. They need to come to it uh, urgently and be able to deal with it. That way, we shall then have some resources yeah. to help in the stimulus programs mm -hmm. that are required. I think. For, I think for, if if if, if yeah. Yes, and 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 and, and uh, so that we can quickly uh, give uh, the the economy the the impetus that is required okay. for it to now generate 
uh, additional revenue T tell and growth tax base for KRA. Tell me this, Honorable Mudavadi, you yeah. vied for the presidency not once but uh, a, a couple of times previously. If you are in that seat to tonight... Only once. Only yes. once. Only once. Okay, I beg your pardon for yes. that. If I'm you are in that seat... To <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I vied for the presidency once. Once. If you were yes. in that seat tonight, I don't know about your future ambitions, in a sentence or two, what would be your priority? Going forward, uh, where we sit now, mm -hmm. let me tell you, uh, the most important priority is going to have a country that is, to have a country that is united okay. and focused on the economic recovery. That is the priority. That would be your priority if you were in that seat tonight. <laughs> To have an economy that will create jobs, an economy that will function, and an economy that will make sure that we have a nation where the government is working for the people, okay. and not a government that is working for a few elites. Let, let me add on that point. Go ahead. Go on ahead. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me add on that point the Honorable Mudavadi has mentioned. I, I think today, more than at any other time in the history of this country, mm. We need statesmanship in this, as from, the, from our leaders today, from the president. Kenyans expect statesmanship today more than at any other time in the history of this country. This is the time when the president needs to come out as a leader of this nation, not a leader of a party, not a leader of a group, and bring together every Kenyan, whether they're his opponents or his friends, bring them to a table, and discuss with them the future of this. I think this is, this is fundamental. So it's really disappointing when you see people talking still about referendums, about when will this thing end, we go back to our political party, you know, uh, the, 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 the dishonesty, the tricurrence politics of is still playing out daily on our, you know, in, 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 our, in, our, in, our, in our country, when in fact it, it clearly shows we do not appreciate the crisis that Kenyans are facing today. I think what Kenyans did today from the leader who is sitting up there on the hill is nothing short of a statesman who can lift them out of this crisis because there are millions of Kenyans. It's not about half a million. I think that's understatement. The number of Kenyans who are going to be out of jobs mm -hmm. in the next few months will be in millions because I know I'm in industry and I know what's happening to many of the businesses. We know what is happening to many of the manufacturing institutions. Okay. Clearly, there's a serious problem and people are being laid off in large numbers. We have shut down many companies. So I, I think it's important that, uh, and, and, and there'll be no revenues to come in. There'll be no money to be spent. And I, I think there'll be no one to give you loans. Let us be very clear. They, all the countries in the world have crisis. To try and imagine that you can go to IMF or World Bank or London or New York and mm -hmm. get money today, I think is wishful thinking. Okay. I think what countries are doing the developed countries is to give a moratorium of a year or two years probably on the highly indebted countries of the, uh, okay. Africa, for example, countries in Africa. I think what we need to do is to really mobilize our leadership and to try and, you know, mobilize all the resources, mm -hmm. rationalize our expenditure, and try and put money in the pockets of Kenyans so that they can get something to eat and they can get back to school and you can improve on their health. Okay. And believe it or not, our time is pretty much up. But a final question to both of you that Honorable uh, Belokero has already, in a sense, touched on. Uh, the feeling that the political class at a time like this is not quite in touch with a man or woman on the ground. Honorable Mudavadi, I want to get your response to that. That some feel that whilst um, ordinary Kenyans are struggling to put food on the table tonight, to find a place to sleep tonight, politicians out there are planning uh, coalitions, uh, meetings, etc., some secret uh, with the eye or focus towards 2022. As a member of the political class yourself, what would you say to that? Yes. I think uh, on this one we can't run away. Uh, there are some activities and uh, there are some uh, uh, things that people are engaged in, some conduct uh, of the political leaders that is putting some of us to shame. It's giving political, the, the, the name of politics, it's giving politics a bad name, let me put it that way. And, you, and you, are not, you are not involved in any of this, I trust, as you no, make that statement. It's not, yeah, uh, you see, why, why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because our focus, and indeed we should focus. You know, there are some guys who are even invoking the president's name, but they're busy politicking from a particular different uh, perspective. They're not even really invoking it in the real context of mm. fighting the pandemic and working towards the economic recovery. 
I mean, some of these activities are impulsive. On a, on a, to use the, the, that kind of terminology, mm-hmm. yeah. because we have floods in Budala. Yeah. Uh, we have floods in Tana River, along the, the river, whether it's Garissa all the way to Tana River. We have floods in Nyando. Mm-hmm. We have floods in, 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 in Baringo and other places. And here we are being seen to be involved in completely extraneous uh, activities. Where is our moral fiber? So this is not healthy in terms of what we are projecting. Okay. We are supposed to follow the we are supposed to follow the guidelines. We are supposed to know we are supposed to keep social distancing. But what are we doing as leaders? Quite a number of us are the front line in making sure that we are breaking those laws. Now, if the ordinary person, mm. the ones you showed us when you started this program, mm-hmm. can see that the leaders are already behaving as if it's business as usual, mm. then who are we? to tell them that you must continue obeying certain guidelines. So these are things that we must deal with. Okay. And I hope this is an opportunity that as we go forward, uh, we can live up to uh, uh, what we are supposed to live up to. And if we don't... Briefly, please. Mm-hmm. This is also a golden opportunity for the voters to now examine us. Remember, there's an ambassador who said, choices have consequences. Mm-hmm. This is a good opportunity for the voters to look at the Kenyan leadership afresh and make sure that when that time comes in 2022, then they can make informed decisions on leaders who can be committed to the welfare of this country. Okay. Some would say that you slipped in a little campaign slogan there at the very end, but nevertheless, thank you for your thoughts and uh, on this. Honorable Bilokero, <laughs> briefly, your final thoughts on this, and you can also respond to the same question that Honorable... No, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think our politics... Our politics, I agree, has always been uh, politicians have focused more on self-survival and, as usual, misplaced priorities. Even in the worst of days when these COVID things were being announced, you hear about our leaders, top leaders, meeting on scheming on how to remove so and so and bring so and so on. What I, I think really um, it's unfortunate, but there comes a time, and I keep repeating this. If there will be a time when the leader of the nation must strive to the occasion. You cannot have a leader mm-hmm. where people talk about his actions or his plans all the time and he does not rise on one occasion to say, no, I haven't said this. No, that is not my plan. Yes, it is my plan. Yes, it is my opinion. I mean, there are times you're when you need about to come President, out as just a leader for, for and clarity, really... For clarity, you're talking about President Uru Kenyatta. For clarity, yes. Okay, go yes. ahead. I, I think it's important so that then all this infighting, particularly within the ruling party, is not good for this country. I mean, I, it, really, it's, it, it, it really touches on his office and he has kept mum about it for years now. And I think he needs to come out really, either put, a, you know, uh, an end to it or you know, clearly come out so that we get a country that is moving forward and pulling in one direction okay. uh, rather than, um, you know, all this, all this, um, because the way things are going, we may not even in the next two, three, you hear every day, there's a reshuffle, for this, this, there's that. And so, so honestly, then in that kind of a situation, we don't expect uh, the economy, the economy will be on the back burner very soon. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. That has been Honorable Bilokero, uh, former F- Senate Finance Committee Chairperson, former Mandera Senator, together with Honorable Musalia Mudavadi, who's the ANC party leader and also a former finance minister. We've gotten quite some feedback. Maybe I can read one or two uh, SMSs as we wrap up. These are some of your thoughts. One person here says, economic helplessness, homelessness, joblessness, foodlessness have been the norm for Kenyan leadership in the last 17 years. This has had no correlation with COVID-19, which is less than five months old in Kenya. Okay, an indictment on our leadership. And our last tweet here, this one coming in from uh, Collins Bore. I cannot agree more with Honorable Musalia. The debt appetite among African countries is insatiable. They keep going back for more. It's time our government reconsider this since many Kenyans have been forced to dig deeper into their already empty pockets to pay loans. Thank you so much to my two guests for being a part of this conversation, for sharing their views diverse and of course really helping the viewers understand their perspectives and of course everyone who's watched this broadcast tonight who sent us a tweet or an SMS, Asante Sana. On behalf of the whole team that's made Newsnight possible tonight and of course my sign language interpreter, Yulan Zale, thank you so much uh, for watching the program. Have a safe and a good night.